So first we'll try and look at what are the types of perfusion that are available and then limitations that we face uh, in contrast uh, perfusion studies. We look at the principles and the basis uh, for arterial spin labeling. Just look at what is a, what was the evolution since some time because ESL has been around, but because of going up, it's quite uh, a stable, uh, stable sequence, stable acquisition. But now I also use it on a 1.5T, and I'll show you examples where both look identical. If you would, you would not know one picture from the other. So let's look at what, what we're measuring with ASL. We are not measuring blood volume. We are only measuring blood flow. And we already know from other techniques what is the gray matter uh, CBF and what is the white matter CBF in an adult patient. And it's white matter is approximately half that of the gray matter. And in children, because the metabolic activity is high or uh, neuronal development is uh, going on, it's higher blood flow into the brain. And as we age, uh, we have less blood flowing into the brain or even into the parenchyma. So in perfusion, uh, the types of perfusion, which include contrast, we're looking at T2 star, which I made a mention of already. And we are also looking at K-trans or T1-weighted images, which is more of a laboratory work at, the, at present. It takes about five to six minutes. The advantage of DSC is it takes about a minute. Uh, and non-contrast uh, arterial spin labeling uh, takes about five minutes. So in DSC, we are using contrast as a label. In arterial spin labeling, we are using inherent water uh, as a label. So the protons in the water are used as a label. And what are the pitfalls that we are facing with DSC? Because I get to do about four or five brain tumor patients on a daily basis, uh, which come at every phase of their diagnosis and surveillance that we find some difficulties in repeating or maintaining quality, same quality that we got on the index scan, on the follow-up scan, such as getting a venous axis. Then if it's a lesion which is close to the skull base where you have uh, artifacts caused by bone, uh, we have issues. Uh, we can, because of the susceptibility, there's an overlap with real perfusion happening within the lesion. So we are not very, very confident, confident about that. Again, we'll see examples of this. You can't easily repeat the use of contrast in a patient. It's difficult to explain and it's difficult to, and it's costly. And quantification is not possible. So when we come to ASL, uh, we are using an inherent contrast. So there's no exogenous injection. What we are doing in this is that we are first obtaining a control. Then we are doing an, a labeling in the neck where the blood, flow, blood is flowing through the carotid vessels. We allow some delay and then acquire the same image as the control. So we have a tagged image and we have a control image. When the tagged image is subtracted from the control, we get a uh, flow map, which is called as the CBF map. So there are three or four types of arterial spin labeling. One is continuous, which is the one which started before. It has a larger slab. And the second one is pulsed, which has a smaller slab. The one we use now is called as uh, pseudo continuous so that's a combination of pulsed and continuous and gives the best SNR with the best timing possible there is also a type of ASL called as velocity selective which allows us to map the vessels actually we'll see an example of this uh, later on so most of the work that I will be showing you is pseudo continuous labeling on a three Tesla machine and a few patients from 1.5 Tesla machine same technique uh, so in this, uh, we have the slab, the tagging slab is a little smaller and we have the whole brain coverage. So we had limited coverage in continuous and pulse, but in this you have maximum coverage and we have a good labeling efficiency. So we have a good SNR and with 3T, we have better imaging because there's better background suppression and you have higher noise, signal to noise ratio as for any imaging, any body part imaging. But this is an example of a 1.5T versus 3T in the same patient. If you see the left side image is a 1.5T and the right side image uh, to my right is a 3 Tesla image. Sorry, I, I don't have a cursor where I can show it to you by pointing out. So I hope we are on the same page as when I tell you my right and my left. So... Uh, what, what we have here is a little better signal to noise ratio. If you see at the same level, I've tried to obtain. Otherwise you cannot make out whether the lead, uh, if you had these images by themselves, 
single images, we would not be able to tell which is 1.5t, which is 1.3, sorry, 3t. So it's a little better signal to noise ratio, sharper images, a little more confidence, but you can do the same work on 1.5t with experience. So this is how the maps look. This is the acquisition actually in the raw data. They are very crude looking maps. Uh, you What information we can derive from these maps is that you have a black color in the center and a white color on the periphery. If we look carefully, the white, the black color corresponds to the white matter and the, gray, the whitish or the grayish color corresponds to the cortex. And if we ever to infer something, we know the cortex is receiving more blood flow than the white matter, which is what we already expect. And when we try and code it with color, this is what we'll get. Again, we have a choice of coding, uh, using whichever a spectrum of color that we choose to, uh, whichever shows the lesion better is what I would suggest. In GE Funk Tool Workstation, I use a map called as Assist at times, and uh, I will show you the rainbow map most of the time, but sometimes I use Assist to, when the blood flow within a lesion is very high, it just demonstrates how much aggressive the lesion appears to be. So what is the correlation that has been worked out in the literature? I'm, I don't know if you're seeing my references below, but this is from a 2003 paper uh, way back. And what they've been able to find out is that the low-grade tumor and high-grade tumor has a certain amount of blood flow, which corresponds to uh, white matter for the low-grade and about three or four times the uh, cortex in the high-grade. And for metastasis, it goes even higher up. So for us, the question is that if, been, if we've been using DSC for so long, how will we replace it or how will we use ASL in, in its place? So then the, the question is to correlate DSC with, that means RCBV with the CBF that we get from ASL. And that also found good correlation, as you can see in the second uh, half of the slide. It's a DSC tumor blood flow versus uh, normal parenchyma, normalized to the normal parenchyma, we have 0.68 and 1.2 for a low-grade tumor versus high-grade tumor. And you have the same similar values when ASL, the CBF calculated from ASL sequence was used for t tumor blood flow versus cerebral blood flow, normal cerebral blood flow. So uh, what I would like to show you is that uh, we've done our cases on a 3 Tesla 750 WGE uh, it's, we use the HNU coil. What you must pay attention to is the way you plan the sequence. It has to be an orthogonal axial plane. It cannot be oblique. Uh, we try and keep the slice thickness to 4 mm. The number of slices will vary on depending on what you are, what size of the head you are covering. But for an adult average, we use 34 slices. We plan going from the mid cerebellum up to outside of the vertex. That means you don't stop where the brain pan camera stops as you would do for a actual localizer for T2. Here you go out of the skull bone and out of the vertex. <clears throat> what I would like you to pay attention to is the one which is in green delay according to age. So I did speak about tagging and then a delay. So that's what we mean by here. There is a critical value that your technician needs to be trained to insert into the sequence depending on the age of the patient. If it's a young patient, it's a little different value. When it's an elderly patient, it's a different value. So these values are already provided to you by the vendor. You make sure that your technicians are well trained to choose the correct value and put it into the post-label delay. And then when I had to initially use ASL and try to find out whether it was as good as perfusion or not, I did identical planning for both. And we did the three, four, uh, 3D post contrast Bravo imaging for anatomic planning for overlay and then there is post processing involved. So the post processing is same as you would do it do for any perfusion. You use it uh, use a normal contralateral location ma mainly the white matter to compare and uh, get your values. Uh, whatever you use once please stick to that. Uh, and but what is the difference in a DSC perfusion and an ASL? You saw how low signal to noise ratio is in those gray maps. So we have to be very careful to the anatomy on the overlay maps and make sure that we are not interpreting one over the other because a small blood vessel which you do not happen to see on the grayscale image, you only because of the anatomical uh, correlation, you may find out that it's actually just close to a low, uh, low flow area rather than actually itself the lesion. We'll, I'll show you ahead what I mean by that. Uh, and then we compared these DSC, RCBF and RCBV, 
and uh, we found we had very good correlations in about uh, 165 patients so we did totally I kind of uh, focused on these first few patients consecutive patients index as well as follow-up scans to see if I was I could rely on ASL equally as I would could rely on DSC in uh, D 41 patients we could not do because of technical issues the perfusion imaging which involved contrast injection in both were satisfactory in about 165 patients and we had concordance in 146 patients and discordance in, discordance in 19. We'll see examples of the discordance also. So let me begin with some examples just to take you through. This is a left insular gli glioma. It's an oligoastro, a wrong terminology for the current CNS classification. Oh, previously this was allowed, I need to change it in my slide. And it's either oligo now or an astrocytoma now. Uh, but earlier this this is what we used to call it and uh, that means that you have an astrocytoma with oligodendroglial phenotype and uh, you have the molecular to fall back on whether it's really an astrocytoma or an oligo and uh, if you see the right hand side the grayscale image of the arterial spin labeling showing you a very minimal high flow compared to the right insula demonstrating that we are looking at some area which is taking a little bit of higher blood flow if you see on DSC maps, which are at the bottom left, we can't see any difference in with the low grade and versus high grade. So I found ASL a little bit more sensitive to lead me towards a lesion, not necessarily call it low grade versus high grade. I would still call it low grade in this because it's the cortex, which is marginally uh, uh, showing higher flow. Coming to another lesion, which is very heterogeneous in the left frontal parenchyma in a young man, uh, non-enhancing, very close to the skull base, so you see the paranasal sinuses are close to it. This is going to cause a very large susceptibility artifact on DSC. But here we see a very uh, nice red looking area in the center of the lesion close to the paranasal sinuses demonstrating high flow. So I'm, I've shown you a DSC perfusion where we are seeing artifacts on the color map. The one which is the third image on the top besides the curves is the raw data of the DSC and you can see that there's a big artifact coming from the air which is overlapping. So just a bit of uh, information for the students or people who are starting off using DSC perfusion now. It's not only the color maps that you look at, you have to actually look at the entire data set, the raw data set that you have and see whether there is really additional susceptibility in uh, compared to the baseline that you have. And uh, so it's a difficult area to confirm whether the susceptibility that we see is because of the lesion or is it because of the uh, artifact. But in ASL, we do not have such an issue if you compare both the maps. So the one, the map lower down, which you see is the assist map that I told you, with a higher grade component or a high blood flow component, it really stands out. Uh, so this is a one way where you know that at least this part of the lesion needs to come out if it's a large lesion and the goal is only debulking and not radical excision. We know that this part must come out, otherwise we are leaving a lot of high grade component inside and also it may have, uh, give rise to a sampling error on histopathology if we've not targeted this area. So this is a post-op where because we've kind of planned it properly for the surgeon, they've been able to take it out, right? So this is a DSC, sorry, ASL CBF map after the surgery where we see that the area which was showing high blood flow is completely taken out. Coming to another example of an infiltrative tumor which will have low grade as well as high grade components just like the one we saw previously and we know that a high cellularity uh, demonstrated on diffusion is the one we should target on which is on the top row right side but that area is showing very faint enhancement and we have some area which is showing uh, susceptibility on the gradient echo images posteriorly that is a site of biopsy and what we have on DSC is the correct localization for the area which is showing high cellularity so this is for the people who would initially be starting out on ASL working on ASL maybe you can correlate with other techniques that you already are familiar with and keep using them to reinforce what you're seeing uh, as accurate in interpretation or not. So again, this area is the one we need to monitor and we kept monitoring how this was responding to treatment on follow-up scans. Coming to a very high-grade neoplasm, so we have an infiltrative component in the left temporal parenchyma inferiorly near the temporal horn. Coming to the next area, we have a very uh, heterogeneous lesion which is showing heterogeneous enhancement and 
high CBF on uh, ASL and RCBV is also elevated. So if you see the map, both the maps really correlate quite well. You have centrally an area which is showing less perfusion. So again, you know which area needs to be sampled to make sure you get the best histopath histopathology result. Now coming to post-op status, uh, most, uh, most of the times I've found people saying that because there is hemorrhage in the tumor bed, uh, susceptibility weighted imaging will not help. So there's no need of doing a perfusion, but we do perfusion in all our patients. What we look out for is that uh, there is going to be some uh, hemosiderin, some blood products around the cavity or within the cavity. We disregard that and we look on the raw data what additional susceptibility is coming up. So now that involves a lot of skill, a lot of experience. The radiologist has to be present when post-processing or maybe post-process herself when, or himself. But in ASL, you get a map which is on the right, lower row right side, bottom. Uh, and you see that there is a very clear area which is showing high blood flow. And this is not an artifact coming from the hem hemorrhage, but it is real perfusion, which we have correlated from the DSC as well and uh, morphology as well. And because when we compare with the pre-operative scan, we'll know what was the residual tumor, uh, what is the residual tumor likely to look like. So ASL really helps us take away the uh, error or the need error made by post-processing, uh, the person who's doing post-processing, or help the clinic, uh, help the radiologist to confirm the findings, whether both are concurrent or not. So it kind of makes life a little bit easier if you're doing a high volume of brain tumor patients. Coming to a uh, lesion-like lymphoma, this is a case of multifocal lymphoma, T2 um, dark areas with homogeneous enhancement, restricted diffusion, multiple foci. We have hypoperfusion on uh, DSC, but we have high flow on uh, ASL maps, which are shown below. The characteristic perfusion map of the uh, horizontal limb going up after the recovery. And we this is quite uh, indicative of lymphoma. And just to confirm that we have some similar pattern on uh, ASL, we have high flow. So all the lymphoma patients that we've seen till now, we have a bit of high flow. And uh, this is this patient has an additionally an arteriovenous fistula on the right side. What you can see is there is less flow on the left side, left cerebral hemisphere, because of the steel phenomenon. A lot of blood is flowing towards the lesion on the right side. But all the lesions are showing high flow on the limb on the uh, ASL map. Now, why does why is that helpful, especially in the post? In the surveillance setting, if you have high flow, you know you're looking at some kind of a neoplastic process. Another example of a lymphoma in the left cerebellum, uh, it's in the left uh, perimedullary cistern and inferior cerebellum, uh, homogeneously enhancing lesion and showing high flow in that patient. Uh, we have not much high flow. So you have a comparative here where you have some flow in the uh, cerebellar cortex, sinuses and arterial flow. And we have some, the flow is almost equal to what you have in the right cerebellar cortex. So this is a mar marginally high flow in the lesion. So we know we are not looking at something like a metastasis, which where we would expect very high flow. Cerebellum being a common location for that. Uh, coming to a, a primitive neuroectodermal tumor in the posterior fossa, very high flow, all the maps matching. So you have a DSC CBF map, we have a DSC CBV map, and a ASL CBF map, all matching. Coming to an anaplastic ependymoma, similar looking lesion in a similar location with different morphology, uh, which will show us inferior extension into the fourth ventricle. And what we have on ASL is uh, just a small area of high flow. So when we know, when we, sorry. When we compare this lesion versus this lesion, we know we are looking at not such an aggressive tumor as a PNET, and we may be able to support our morphological diagnosis of append anaplastic ependymoma when the uh, morphology is not as clear as in this case. So these are subtle uh, ways we can use ASL. Now coming to this patient, I was following her up for almost two years. She is a case of breast cancer. She was a case of breast cancer. We lost her some time ago with five metastases, which were treated with SRS plus medication going on for uh, uh, controlling these metastases. 
Now we had all of them responding well to uh, the therapy, except one which kept growing. So uh, here, if you see in the first image, the coronal T2, we can see some cortical thickening with heterogeneity. I would expect this, even on the morphology, to be just a metastasis, metastasis with no uh, differential of treatment-related changes, but it's very difficult to tell the clinicians the same. We kept following up, the lesion uh, showed high flow and eventually grew uh, significantly and DSC map also showed high flow. So this is an example where uh, we had, sorry, in this patient we could not do DSC except in the index scan because uh, with treatment we had, she had veins which were very friable and we could not get a good injection. So we called this as a metastasis and not treatment related change and that's what it turned out to be. We lost her after that. Now another example, uh, grade 3 oligoastrocytoma in the right frontal region, uh, post-operative radiotherapy planning also is drawn out on the image, responded very well after radio and chemotherapy, a small new lesion coming up very close to the tumor bed with some infiltration happening into the right insular region. Clinician not ready to believe that we are looking at a neoplastic process. Perfusion, uh, it said connect server, it said connect server, uh, excuse us for a minute, we'll just check, so, do you want me to click? Yes, you can. Click? No, it's coming. Connect. Change the slide. Okay. So uh, we had a new lesion and the clinician was not ready to accept that we could have such an early recurrence in an anaplastic lesion, that means intermediate grade lesion after a very good treatment. But And this was very close to the skull base, so we had limited utility in, I don't have, it's not moving. So we, uh, we had limited utility in terms of perfusion, it, not, it did not show hyperperfusion. We know spectro also would not be good in this location because of the heterogeneity and artifacts. And But cortex was involved, so I was certain we are looking at a uh, lesion which is, uh, which is a recurrence. So this is the in first time that we picked it up and this is the follow-up after six months where the lesion has increased in size. And this is the CDF map. So this was, sorry, this is the first index imaging where the recurrence was suspected. So this this is the six, this is the ASL map which did pick pick this up. Perfusion was equivocal. It, it showed isoperfusion. So although we had a very strong suspicion on the morphology of a recurrence, we could not prove it adequately ex if we did not have ASL, so we called this as uh, tumor recurrence. There was a short term follow up of four months. So this is a six month follow up and a four month follow up. And we have the lesion growing in size and now perfusion becoming positive. So there is a delay in the perfusion becoming positive in some cases, especially when we have the anatomical uh, areas not conducive for doing a good DSC scan. Now, incidentally, this is a similar um, pathology, grade 3 oligoastro at that time again. We have a good uh, treatment uh, protocol, same one, post RT and CT status after 1.5 years, coming up with a new lesion, which is periventricular in location and showing central enhancement, sorry, central necrosis. Uh, we would expect treatment related change, and this is what the ASL is showing. It correlated well with DSC. Now, two lesions in a similar pathology patient at the same time in the surveillance and both are different diagnoses and both are confirmed by ASL as with DSC. Now, I just want you to pay attention to these color maps. We see that the right side is less showing less flow. The entire right cerebral hemisphere is showing less flow compared to the left. And that's because that area is getting high, uh, more of the vasculopathic changes which are happening as a result of the radiotherapy treatment. Uh, at times, uh, the scans are done outside and we get these patients only to 
for ASL uh, to be used as a problem solving tool. So again, a long course of treatment in an anaplastic astrocytoma where TMZ was continued for a fairly long time and a new uh, peripherally enhancing lesion came up which was not looking like the index tumor and there was a query whether we are looking at a um, neoplasm or a treatment induced change and we have this high CBF in the wall of the lesion which confirms that we are looking at a recurrent disease which is bound to happen after a long surveillance. Another example of a recurrent disease, a multiple enhancing lesions, only one of them showing mild hyperperfusion in the bottom row uh, indicated by the right by the red arrow but if you see the ASL CBF map on the right side all the lesions are showing high flow so in this patient we have no doubt that we're looking at a multifocal recurrence now a pontine lesion in a young patient with some kind of expansion and high flow we would worry about it being a neoplasm but if you look carefully there is an area which is also showing almost no flow and we suspected demyelination so this patient was treated with steroids, had recurrence of symptoms and you see the morphology is completely changed and uh, showing the, well, another thing we must know is that basilar artery is very close to the medial aspect of the lesion. We expect some artifacts there, which is what we are seeing even in the subsequent uh, follow-up scan, but the lesion per se is showing low flow or marginally high flow. Uh, its utility in stroke also is uh, now becoming accepted widely. We have our uh, stroke physicians, uh, neurophysicians wanting ASL in every patient that they suspect stroke in. So without contrast injection, we can give them a diffusion perfusion mismatch map. If you see the diffusion uh, abnormalities just over two spots in the pre-treatment scan and a large perfusion defect on the ASL. And when once the patient was treated, you have complete recovery with the flow being restored completely. So uh, another example of a no mismatch, diffusion perfusion showing equal uh, uh, insult. But when the patient was treated, we have a small area which is medially showing low flow and some hyperperfusion along the cortex, so a luxury perfusion map in this patient. That means most of the uh, parenchyma has recovered, but there is still some ongoing ischemic change. Another example of a diffusion perfusion mismatch, recovery after treatment, although you still have some areas showing the diffusion uh, persistent. It was done very early into with before the diffusion uh, abnormality could resolve, like within a day or two. Uh, how are the infections looking? Uh, giant tuberculoma, left temporal lobe showing high low flow same with dsc we already know it's hypoperfused we are confirming that asl has similar pattern this was about a big lesion but what about the small lesions the small lesions also look uh, show low flow so i was telling you we have to look carefully at the anatomy and the overlay so if we did not point out to the lesion clearly the cbf within the surrounding vessels would tell us we're looking at high flow or, we, or even within the cortex but we need to point out to the anatomy very well on the uh, anatomic images. So another example of neurocysticercosis, uh, low flow. This would become important, this experience would become important when we're looking at metastasis and we demonstrate high flow within the wall of the lesion. Uh, this was an interesting case, uh, T2 abnormality in a patient of leukemia on treatment presenting with convulsions. So we have a setting of, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, a CNS infection versus we are looking at recurrence of disease uh, like chloromas. So this focal lesion on the T2 is all that we could see on the plane scan and it, and it did not show enhancement. It showed cortical involvement and involvement of the subcortical white matter so it did not match a chloroma and when we did the ASL there was a larger area involved. In fact the abnormality is going into the left frontal region so again, we had that message, connect server. Hmm. Click here. Okay, sorry about those gaps, it's the technical issues here. 
So uh, we have high flow going on into the parasagittal location as well as in the left frontal region way superiorly. And uh, we found that uh, we were looking at an infective process unilaterally affecting, affecting one cerebral hemisphere and actually uh, a larger area than the one which is uh, a larger area actually. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, I need to get back. Give me a second. So the CNS, this was, uh, we concluded we are looking at a CNS uh, infection occurring while the patient is on maintenance chemotherapy. And uh, this is the follow-up scan where the lesions have completely resolved. The ASL map was also normal. The only thing we see now is a small area of gliosis in the left parietal region. So coming to false positive, what are the things where we have false positive? So and very few cases, less than that, I would say on DSC, we found blood products interfering with the evaluation. Maybe it is dependent on the age of the hematoma. We need to do some work on that and try and localize which hemorrhages are giving us that issue, which type of blood products are giving us that issue. Coming to inflammation, as we saw, uh, any kind of inflammation would show, attract more flow into that area. And then whether we are looking at a neoplastic lesion versus um, uh, just a reactionary lesion that we need to be separating out, not relying on ASL completely. A new thing that I have found in the patients when I do a lot of surveillance uh, is SMART syndrome, which is coming up. I'll show you examples of that. There's early recurrence, uh, proximity to skull base and small lesions and lymphoma are also causing issues. Okay, this is an example of SMART syndrome. We have a treatment-induced necrosis in the left parietal occipital region. Another area of treatment-induced necrosis in the right medial occipital region. You can see a cavity, which is a primary tumor bed, more in the parietal occipital region, more in the medial occipital region. And on the ASL map showing no high flow in the areas of enhancement and diffusion showing restral, central restriction, which is more confirming with the acute necrotic change which is happening. When we did follow up, we found in the, if you see on the T2 in the right lateral temporal cortex, there is chiral thickening with some kind of chiral enhancement and high flow. If you see on the ASL map, which is the grayscale map on the bottom row on the right side, uh, second row on the right side and the color map showing high flow. So this is a false positive where we see high flow in the vicinity of the tumor bed and we suspect recurrence, but if we give some time to this patient and do a short-term follow-up, this lesion regresses, as in this case, we have given the patient steroids. We can see the entire um, radiation treatment-induced necrosis also going down and healing of the lateral, temporal, uh, and parietal cortex uh, enhancement and uh, T2 abnormalities. There are some false positives I've found in pilocytic astrocytoma case, lesions like pilocytic astrocytoma some infective diseases. And uh, this is an example of an enhancing component in the right thalamic uh, pilocytic astrocytoma, no uh, uh, high flow on DSC, CBF or CBV, but we have high flow on the ASL map, which is inferiorly located on the right side. We see the area of high flow, which is seen as red and corresponding to the area of enhancement. So if we are not careful with the anatomy and we don't Play, pay proper attention to the clinical presentation, we may mistake this for a higher grade tumor. So we also get to correlate our patients with the FET and FLT PET. And this one is a left frontal index tumor bed, which is showing treatment induced necrosis, low flow on um, ASL map, a new nodule coming up on the right side, which is also showing low flow, but very high uptake on FET PET. And I must say this patient had high flow, sorry, high RCBV in the right frontal lesion. So DSC uh, scored over ASL in this patient. But most of the times we've had ASL pick up abnormalities faster than or earlier than uh, earlier than um, DSC. ASL is usually picking up uh, flow faster than DSC. Now, this is the velocity selective uh, uh, ASL that I was talking about and plus other areas of, uh, with, of the body which are also being uh, studied with ASL. So you get uh, a photogram in the liver, 
uh, only the right carotid system or only the left vertebral system if you do correct tagging with velocity selective and there is an attempt to even look at the flow within the um, cardiac musculature. Fusion of whole brain fMRI and ASL is also being attempted. ASL because uh, there is a, a use of um, bold act, uh, phenomenon even in ASL, they are trying to do functional MRI with ASL. So a lot of things uh, expected in future with ASL technique, uh, given its potential for non-invasive quantification. Uh, no contrast is also a, a boon, especially in pediatric patients, when we cannot take these large bore catheters and if they are on chemotherapy and we need to keep repeating these scans, we can spare them the uh, problem about injections. But there are limitations. Uh, if you have motion, it's an issue. It already has a low SNR. Uh, we are not sure what happens to patients who have these vascular diseases, like the one I showed you example of the arteriovenous fistula. We wouldn't know how to interpret the flow within the lesion if it was in vicinity of the fistula or even on the opposite side where they're already reduced flow. So these are some issues which we need to work on and solve. Uh, there's also this uh, post-label accuracy. Are we really being accurate with a post-label delay? But just to conclude, uh, in the background of uh, the uh, lack of post-processing that is involved, lack of tremendous, like the expertise in post-processing that is involved, ASL forms a very important part of uh, neuroimaging in a clinic where brain tumors or CNS pathologies are scanned uh, in big numbers and I think it would really be useful on case-to-case -case basis to replace uh, DSC is not the idea. Many times I'm asked whether will you replace DSC with the ASL completely but if you are anyway going to inject contrast for morphology and it DSE just takes one minute, I would rather have it with me than omit it completely unless uh, required to be omitted in terms of uh, poor injection.